probably don't need one for everybody in here. Y'all know I was a cheerleader once upon a time. However, for all you online, you can't hear me. All you see is my mouth moving. So we will go ahead with a mic. So I just love how God works everything out, and he brings everything together. He takes everything that seems to be chaos, and he just puts it in order. Uh, this morning, I decided what I was going to be telling you about and, and the, the verses and everything that I was using. And then I get here this morning, and the first song that was playing was about joy, joy down in your heart, you know. And I'm just like, oh, God, this is so good. Because this week, I was just kind of going on about my week, not saying much about anything. And my dear beloved husband goes, you haven't been doing your devotions this week, have you? Why would you say that? Because I can tell. <laughs> oh, yes, ladies, he went there. <laughs> he says, I can tell. He says, you have no joy. You're mean-spirited. You need your devotions. <laughs> you know, it's like, yes, sir. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I opened up my devotions, and the first thing it said was the thief of joy. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, God. Okay, here we go. So Psalms 118.24 says that this is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Psalms 33.21, in him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Ne Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Right there it is. Psalms 34.5, those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. Psalms 97.11, let light shine Light shines on the godly and joy on those whose hearts are right. Uh, Psalms 126.3, the Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. So let me ask you, have you been doing your devotions this week? People can tell. And with that, I am your campus pastor and I will be there in just a moment. Amen. Boy, you never knew. You never saw that coming, did you? She just set you up and took you out and they're bringing me water. God bless you so much. In my Faith Family Worship Center cup. Oh, here, let me do it from this side so you see it. There you go. Because mm. JP's coffee's got me going. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit's back here and we're going good. All righty. So thank you so much for being here this morning. I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to post online. I'm, I'm going to be preaching here in just a minute. And so that everybody knows. There we go. And uh, you can invite anybody to come to church with you online. It's amazing how technology works. Amen? So if you just want to send them that link, ffwc.live, and they can go ahead and plug into that, and they can watch here right along with you at this very moment. And I encourage you to do so. And those of you online, feel free to invite people to come and join church with you wherever you are at. I'll dismiss the kids this time to head on back to Kids Church. God bless you. Have a wonderful time back there with Miss Nikki. And for everybody else here, welcome home. Amen? It's the middle of July, you know, about this time last year. If there was 10 people in this room, that was a lot. How many of you remember those days? Yes. And so we were, we were all in here, and I thank God for what he is doing in our land today, and we're believing that God is going to continue to do a healing work in our land today. Somebody say amen. And so remember to go to ffwc.us discover to find out what's going on here but let me highlight a couple of things real quickly for all of the ladies of the church in october and the dates are there uh 21 to 23 i believe in daytona beach is the thrive Con conference i want to say a couple of thousand women show up something like that it's a big deal <coughs> and it's a mighty move of god and i <laughs> swallowed went down the wrong pipe <laughs> how embarrassing right on live yeah let me try that again. And so if you would like to know more about that, see either Deanna Germany or Dina Clausen, either one of those. They will be able to fill out that information for you. We can give you some uh, website to go check it out for yourself. It's an awesome event, but you need to pre-register by the 25th of this month so we can get you a good room, a good place. We get everything all set up and ready to go. And I've already seen the list. There's only already like five or six signed up. So if you want to go, we'll be more than happy for you to attend with us. All, all the ladies are welcome. Men, stay home. 
Um, yours is in May. That's whenever yours show up. Yeah, I presume this Wednesday, 6.30, either online or in-house, we started studying the book of Isaiah. We got off to a great start uh, in that book. This is really going to be an awesome study. I would love for you to be a part of it. Feel free to join us online or in-house, 6.30 Wednesday. Also, same time, Voltage Growth Youth Track. The River is this Friday at 6.30 p.m. Now, do I have any people in the house that love to worship? Anybody online, give me some hearts. Uh, anybody here love to pray? You just love to pray, all right? This is for you. Come at 630. We just let the Holy Spirit lead us, and we see what the Holy Spirit does. That's it. And it's just just trusting God to move in hearts and lives. We just turn on some worship music and go for it. Uh, that's all that there is, and we would love for you. We've seen people uh, healed in here. We've seen God do great many things and, and touching people's lives. You're more than welcome to do that this Friday, 6.30, and then this Saturday, 9 a.m., men's breakfast, and there, there will be eggs, lots of eggs, and there will be bacon, and I saw two pounds of bacon back there. We're going to cook all of it. And uh, they're going to be a stack of pancakes this tall, and I'm not exaggerating. And uh, we get coming in, and, and, and the Holy Spirit's going to show up and outshine all of that, all right? And we're going to have a time together. Men, I'm looking forward to be meeting with you this Saturday. And then our Relational Evangelism Seminar with Missionary David Elliott, uh, Elliott on Saturday the 24th. If you can be here, if you're in the area, 9 a.m., if you would, how many of you like like to know of just to be able to f win your friends and your family to Jesus? How many of you would love to be able to do that and do it successfully? Amen. Uh, we're going to get over that fear factor. He's going to be able to show you ways to be able to do this, knock it out of the park, and then he'll be with us in the Sunday service also ministering at that particular point in time. Well, how many of you, whenever you came in, you got one of these bags of Skittles from me here? You got you go, okay, hang on to that there for a second because you're going to need that here in a moment. Um, there's some pictures are going to start to rotating, uh, hopefully online. I think they will in here from last uh, uh, Sunday, which was the 4th of July. First of all, we had the honor, and I want to say because I most likely the owners are online watching us right now, the owners of the Shark Shack, that thank, uh, thank them so much for letting us come and hand out coupons for free ice cream to the families that went in for the church and, and to get to meet people in there and to be able to do that. Somebody give them a great big hand would you please and thanks for that uh, rain and everything else we were able to hit about 50 families uh, that we were able to there was a few families they came in with a lot of kids so we gave them a few more coupons uh, in order to do they were like you, you need some help uh, and they were very bit and everybody was shocked and amazed and pleased uh, that we, they received it very well whenever we handed that to them they're kind of looking at that going well, thanks, a church buying me ice cream. Who, who, who knew you could do that? Uh, but uh, we're doing that. And then for the whole crew that went out to the Palm City Bridge and handed out ice water, who doesn't like nice ice water in the middle of July on top of a bridge over a river in Florida, right? And so uh, we sent a lot of water out, and uh, half of it came back. That, that wasn't that much. I mean, it was, it was a lot of water that we handed out that people appreciated. So to everybody who made that a success, thank you so much. And I thank God for the opportunity for us to be able to show compassion and friendship to our community. How many of you with me on that? Amen. And it's your giving that makes all of that possible. Now, for those of you who receive those Skittles, now if you, you know, if you really want, those of you online, if you wanted Skittles, you can come get Skittles. Um, come by this week. I have some bags left over. We'll be, I'll share with you. But there's seven or eight pieces here in the bag. Now, what if I were to ask you for one of those pieces? Just one of them, all right? You know, if I was to ask for, for one of them so far, some of you uh, find, what might find that a little bit difficult. Some of you would say, well, I've, I've eaten a bunch of them, and I've only got a few left. You know, I, I, I don't want to part with that last one. <laughs> I, I don't want to do that. Some of you would be say, but I've only got one left. I, I'm down to my last piece. Pastor, you can't take the last one away from me. And then there's some of you in here, you already ate them, didn't you? I'm looking around here. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, there they go. <laughs> I don't have any. I, don't, I can't give one back. Well, tithing and giving is a lot like this uh, right here. God, through his blessings, has blessed you with the ability to be able to sow, to give, to tithe into missions, the church, the kingdom of God. 
And what we do with what he has given us matters so much. But sometimes we get so caught up in our expenses, we eat all of our Skittles before we have a chance to give to Jesus. Hello? Amen? And so maybe uh, uh, whenever we have the opportunity, we need to think about, what does God want me to do with what he has blessed me with? Now, Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all of your crops. Now, the key word there is fruit, not Skittles, fruit, all right? Even though Skittles taste like fruit. <laughs> Nobody caught that. Okay, so the, uh, um, we want to make him first in our life, so we give it to him first. We want him first in our time, so we give him the first of our day. We want him first in our lives, so we give him the first day of our week. We want to give him the first of our attitude. We want to give him the first emotion when somebody tries to take us off. Hello. We want to give him the first of everything. And one of the ways that we help discipline ourselves, everybody loves the word discipline, say amen. You have, half of you lied. I know that. Who likes, nobody likes discipline, but we need it. So whenever we give, we want to be able to give. So we want to give that one that's going to be a blessing and an honor to give, put him first in our life because it really helps to line our line up, life up with his word and to live a life that is blessed and is a blessing to others. How many of you like being a blessing? Amen? Okay, five of you. Bless you so much. So if, thank you for being a blessing to the church. They're trying to throw hands up to me like, oh, oh I'm sorry, sorry, I wasn't paying attention the, uh, uh, with that one. Whether you're giving in a receptacle there in the back, I love picking on people. The, uh, there in the back, whether you give via cash app or text giving, you give online at ffwc.us, or whether you just mail it in. However, God bless you for your faithfulness. God bless you for your giving. Not only does it help things like uh, outreaches on the 4th of July, but it also helps us to have kids ministries, youth ministries, hope groups. All the things that we do is because of faithfulness. And I thank God for that. How many of you with me? Lord, I pray that you are blessing upon every gift and giver. I pray a gift upon every life of your blessing this week that whatever they set their hand to will be honored by you. You will take care of them, give them health, keep their marriage safe, keep their family safe, keep their kids safe. Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do in and through us to reach our world for you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen and amen. Well, I'm going to be starting off a new series today called Messy Church. Anybody ever been to a messy church? Hmm. How many of you know you are in a messy church? Hello, there we go. Yeah, there's some of you who were a little bit too quick about raising the hand. I'm just saying right there, you really cut to the chase very quickly. We live in a world where people are broken, selfish, and suffering. We see it all around us. How many of you noticed? We hurt when we discover that children are being traded in sex slavery. We groan watching people trade their life for hell's counterfeits. They trade love for lust, pleasure for they trade pleasure for the peace they could have in Jesus. They want acceptance over salvation. Then the tidal wave of evil recedes back and it reveals its destruction. And the church, I know I've thought this on more than one occasion. We look at that and we go, what are we going to do with that mess? How can we fix that? What can we do about it? Well, then Jesus comes along. He's got a great idea. And here it is. He has this idea that you gather all of these people that are hurting, that are messed up and everything. You pull them all together and you allow the power of his love and of his grace and mercy to completely turn their worlds upside down. Amen? And then you take them. Well, we're not done yet. I know that's where you like to stop is right there. <laughs> Sorry. He is more to the plan. You take them all, and you let them interact together. You let them fellowship. We call that fellowship. It's called building community. You let them build community together, and then you let them worship together, and then you let them love on each other, and you know what happens? It turns into a big mess. <laughs> it gets messy whenever you start doing stuff like that. And messy churches offend some followers of Jesus. Well, it just got quiet in here so fast whenever I said that. 
We like it whenever church is nice and neat and predictable. Hello? When it's safe. Because we know the world out there, it ain't safe. And we have a place called a sanctuary, which by definition means a safe place. That's what it's supposed to mean. But if anything I've learned from being pastor is the fact that it's not necessarily safe in here either. It's true. I'm a, I was a presbyter for 12 years. I've been in enough wars, you know. <laughs> I've had to help pastors through. I've been in enough business meetings to know it wasn't a safe place, all right? Everyone has a preferred picture of how they think believers should behave. Hello. Yeah, I, I'm, listen, I've pastored long enough. Uh, it used to be this, this sweet, sweet little, little old lady. She would come to me, and she, she, she was so old, she did not have a birth certificate and didn't know the year of her birth. We guessed. Her doctor guessed. He didn't know. <laughs> he couldn't figure it out. But I mean to tell you what, every time somebody came in with something she didn't like, boy, she was giving me an earful about it. Boy, and, and, and she didn't have a problem walking up to him and going, now let me tell you. Uh-oh. And I was like, Lord Jesus, no, 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 don't do that. And it was just sometimes, it was just little dinky stuff. It wasn't that big a deal, really, it wasn't. But we get this preferred picture of how things are. How many of you in your house have a messy room or a garage? Okay, half of them raise their hands, the other half are thinking about raising their hands, yeah. How many of you have a messy person in your family? Yes. Stop pointing at each other. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. <laughs> and I know what's happening at home. They're all sitting around pointing at somebody there in the living room. Or something like, it's you. It's you. He's, he's preaching to you. Listen up. How many of you at your job have a messy coworker? There was this, oh, man, the eye rolls. Look at him. Oh, oh man, what's that? Was. Messy is a part of our lives, people. Messy is a part of it. History is messy. Science is messy. Life is messy. That's a reality. But in our desire to have clean and organized, we often crucify the messy people so we can worship in our preferred predictable places. Boy, you didn't see that one coming, did you? I mean, it was just absolute silence on that. We will often discard people who mess up our religion. How many of you thinking, this might have been the day I should have skipped? Um, at this particular moment. Okay. Now think about this for a second. Here's the plan. If you want to know what the plan is, here's the plan. The idea is that all these unkind people, selfish people and hurting people and all that, that we face in our life every day, that we meet on our job, that we're related to, that are our neighbors, or our friends, or whatever the case is, all of these people are potential people that we're supposed to be adding to this assembly of believers. And that's a bit frightening. Because we, you know them, I don't know them. You know them, and you know if they start coming to church here, you're sitting there thinking, oh man, they're going to be giving the pastor a headache. There are two T's that every pastor has on his desk as a general room. Tylenol and Tums. Two things we just, you just learn to live with. All right. I got rid of the Tums. I still have the Tylenol from once in a while. But nonetheless, we, we, we just do this. And you're sitting there thinking, oh, man, we're just going to mess everything. If I invite them here, how are we going to deal with this and all the rest of this stuff? How's a pastor going to clean this up? I'm not going to clean it up. That's Jesus' job. I'm not doing that. I'm I'll show you how to help them, but I'm not doing your job for you. No, no, that's not how this plays. Whenever we begin to understand that all the people that are around us who may frustrate us, anybody frustrates you? How many of I frustrate you? Okay, all right, three hands went up. <laughs> pa pastor Betty, how many are hitting the hearts online? Yes, the pastor frustrates me. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. When these people are frustrating and we think, man, I just want to go somewhere where I don't have to be frustrated anymore, we might be a little selfish. 
Because if any, I, I've learned from pastoring all my, you know, I've been preaching since I was 16. So if anything I've learned is, is that people are frustrating. People frustrated Jesus. I saw that a few times. He, Peter, come on. All right. He had it coming. We know that. But he loved him nonetheless. During the Dark Ages, the Word of God was available to most people. The problem was most people were illiterate. They couldn't read it. And the only person who could, you, most of the people who could read the Bible were the priests because the churches were mostly Catholic back in those days. So all they heard from the Bible was what the priest said on Sunday. So that meant that faith was shaped in the image of that priest, not in the image of Christ necessarily, because they didn't get the full Word of God. How many of you know you can go to church your whole life? I will not preach every scripture that comes out. Okay, you got to you got to get in. You see where I'm going with this, right? Okay. This week I heard this statement: I love Jesus, but I don't believe in religion. Well, I get that. I understand. I'm not a religious person. I don't want to be a religious person from the the culture's point of view of what relig religion is. But I also understand that. I need a framework for my faith in order for it to work. And I need to know where I need to go get that framework is out of the Word of God. Today, the United States of America, we are the most religious country in the world. Proven fact. If you want to start a religion to worship that tree out there, you can do that. I don't suggest it, but you can do that. Now, there are some countries, if you go try to do something, they're like, you're stupid, get out of here. No, they're not going to let you get away with that stuff. We better not find you out there doing that either. But here in East State, you can do it. We are also the most biblically illiterate nation ever in the history of the United States. The same thing that was happening back in the Dark Ages is happening today, not because we're illiterate because we can't read, but because we don't read it. We have now come to a place where younger generations have decided that the Word of God is not necessarily the Word of God. Skepticism in the Bible is now at an all-time high in our nation. Proven fact. And it's hell's goal to discredit the Word of God because without knowledge, people will perish. You think that they don't understand Proverbs 19, 18, where it says without knowledge, people perish? Without an understanding of God's word, people will perish. And we're living in a world today where people are doing just that. Faith without structure will always become a self-serving failure. Faith without structure will always become a self-serving failure. Or in other words, the very person who said, I love Jesus but I don't believe in religion, will end up creating their own false religion to serve themselves. We've decided that faith is going to be what we make of it, not what the Bible says. Here's a problem when we start doing things like that. That leads me to today's text where it says in John 14, 15 through 17, if you love me, if you love me, Jesus said, if you love me, how many of you love Jesus? He said, obey my commands. Boy, I set you up, didn't I? And I'm not even going to apologize for it. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. Mm. There's nothing about this passage that guarantees that your faith in Christ will give you a nice, neat, comfortable free life free of offense and pain and suffering or sacrifice. Nothing. No, not an amen, not an oh my, nothing. I mean, oh wow. What I do see is a promise that the fullness of his love will be poured into your life through the Holy Spirit. I do see that. I do see where the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. That's a commodity that's very rare these days. 
I do see that revealing that truth will empower you to experience and give. Experience and give. To experience and give love. I know a lot of, listen, I don't, you know, people fall in love, out of love. I know, you're all over the, love's a mess. I get that. But the love that Jesus gives us is the center of our lives. It's what holds us together. It opens the door for every, every blessing that comes and flows from heaven. It's given to us because he loves us, not because I earned it or that I deserve it. It's because of his grace, his unmerited favor. He wants to do that for me. And when we receive that love, we can give that love to a world that is dying without it. Now, there are those who are thinking or yelling at the screen, saying the church has failed, the church has made mistakes, the church has done this, the church has done that, and you're going through and you're quoting stuff right now. Maybe a personal experience. Maybe you're, well, this church and this pastor and this, and all the, you know, come on. I admit the church isn't perfect. I admit the church has failed. I admit that the church doesn't fit your image of what you think it should be. I admit all of that stuff. I also admit that the church is people. Hmm. And the reason it's not perfect is because you're not perfect. So, there are a lot of people who want to take the white glove to the church. Let me tell you what's going to happen when you take the white glove to the church. It's going to come back dirty. Now, there's nothing against the custodians of the church. I had to say this in the first service right off of that because they're looking at me going, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> this is a metaphor. I'm making an analogy here because I know my custodians in this church will burn this building down before they'll ever let that thing get dirty. So I just understand. That's the truth, too. So it'll come back dirty. I know this. Our lives, it, come on guys, you guys, you're coming in here, you cleaned up, you look good, but I know there's stuff going on behind your eyes, down deep in your heart that Jesus needs to get a hold of, and if we were to reveal that stuff, this will come out dirty. Come on, amen. So let's go to your house with this same white glove. Oh, hallelujah, all of a sudden everybody's getting repentant real fast, aren't you? Uh-huh. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't clean that. I'm sorry I didn't take the trash out. Stinks a little bit in here. Hmm. Sorry about that. Yeah, really, can you help me organize? I got a messy room over here. I don't know what to do with it. We just shove everything in there we don't know what to do with. And, uh, and all the rest of this stuff. As soon as we start applying this to our lives, we become repentant. But every time we want to take this and apply it to the church, we want to become judgmental. And I don't get that. But I do understand Matthew 1, 7, 1 through 3. Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. There's an idea. Let me say this on a second. That doesn't mean we don't inspect fruit. Now, I read in Galatians that we are to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. The first fruit is love. Now, I know some of you think, well, I can get two, I got two or three of that list covered, gentleness, kindness, uh, the rest of them, not so. No, we're supposed to produce all of them. So I don't have a problem coming along looking for the fruit of the Spirit in your life. I just want you to understand that right now. But if I'm going to judge you, no, 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 oh, no, uh-uh, I can't do that. I learned that a long time ago. I'm bad at it. Uh, and I don't even need a word from God to tell you this. You're bad at it, too. You may be worse than anybody. I don't know. This is, if you, for you will be treated as you treat others. You will be treated, come on, you will be treated as you treat others. If you want to be forgiven, be the person who forgives. If you want the world to cut you some slack, be the person who cuts them some slack. The standard you use in judging, the standard you will be judged when you stand before God 
And if you were a jerk, mm. and why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you got a log in your own? Come on. Hmm. This is where you insert the, if, I guarantee you, if, if this was, if, if Jesus had said this today, you would have been followed with a line. Are you kidding me? You know, that's what probably would have shown up right there. Church, it's messy. It's supposed to be messy. Amen. That's the truth. Stop judging it for being messy. All you're doing is judging yourself. Amen. I don't like that, do you? I was like, oh, that got personal. Love is messy. Every married couple in here knows this. Love is messy. Somebody, all the married people say, <laughs> yeah, uh, we ain't got time for all the stories. Woo! <laughs> Love requires a standard in order to succeed, and that standard is the Word of God. It requires, when you frame your marriage in the Word of God, it works. When you frame your family in the Word of God, it works. When you frame your life in the Word of God, it works. Love without standards will become lust. Love without sacrifice will become selfish. Love without leadership becomes worthless. And love without boundaries will become abusive. That's why we need love. The purpose of love is to lift you up. It's there to lift you up. I know some of you got thinking, man, I got a long ways to go before I see daylight. I get that. But not only is it to lift you up, it's to lift others up too. The love that he gives to you is supposed to lift other people around you. You know, Monday morning gets a bad rap. If you was to walk in and say, thank you, Jesus, for this wonderful day that I have to be able to go to work with this bunch of crabby people. Thank you, Lord, that I am a light in a dark place today because they are all hung over from the weekend and they're not going to be very happy. They're going to be grouchy. They're going to be complaining. They're not going to get much done because they're sitting over there trying to drink more water in order to flush their system out because their head hurts and all the rest of the stuff, stupid stuff they did this weekend. And there's, I know so-and-so's over there at their desk are going to be regretting every bad decision they can't remember because they had a blackout. This is the world we live in. I'm not making this stuff up. But if we determine that we're going to walk into our Monday with the love of Jesus Christ in our heart, that will be a light in a dark place that people will look to. And maybe they're going to squint at it, but they're going to appreciate what they have. Jesus died on the cross because he loved you. He said, well, he took pity on me. Well, thank God for the pity. I'll take it. I'm not ashamed of that. Psalms 41 through 3 says, I have waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. Come on. He heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. Amen. You were in the pit of despair. You were covered in the mud of your sins, of your bad decisions. Oh, everybody looked at the floor again. The, uh, uh, there was, every, you were covered in so much. You thought you were so dirty, nobody would love you. And I guarantee there was a follower of Jesus who got dirty and messy helping you out of that mud and that mire of that world that you were wrapped up in. Somebody who was willing to get down there with you, they didn't have to own the mud. They just got it on them because they loved you enough to get dirty with you. Amen. And then they set you up, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, they begin to clean you up. They begin to scrape that junk off of you. They begin to talk to you. They be, their prayer life was about the mud that was all over you. Their counsel was about your dirty life and how you could clean up and stay and find a purpose and a meaning in life. Their unconditional friendship in the face of criticism in this world about you stood up against the test of time. Their faithful persistence to be an example of a repentant follower of Christ before you, empowered by the Holy Spirit, give 
giving glory to God for the wonderful promises he has kept was an expression of love to you so that you would be able to walk in the same steps that they had found joy in. You say, where do you see this happening? I find it in the Word of God. The Bible says Jesus loved sinners, and they condemned him for it. The Bible says Jesus loved us, and he was crucified for it. The Bible says the apostles loved Jesus and others, and they were criticized for it. The Bible says the early church loved everyone, and they were persecuted for it. What is most important? To love Christ with a faith that wasn't self-serving but sacrificial. To be a giver. We talk about giving and generosity. This is what it's about. What did Jesus say? John 13, 34. A new command I give you. Love one another. He says that and turn the whole world on his ear. One sentence. Just one sentence. (laughs) You tell me Jesus isn't powerful. One sentence right there. 2,000 years later, it's still a new command. People are still discovering this for the first time. It was messy then. And it is messy now. Whenever he said it, it was something that had to be a process that went through the time of seeing people delivered from the junk that they were in. And then we read along in the New Testament and we find things like Corinth and Galatia and Ephesians and Laodicea. And what are those churches about? They were a hot mess and they needed help. I think there was a time probably in the early church whenever they, if they got a letter from an apostle, the pastor was going, oh, what did we do wrong now? They, uh, it was like, what's going on? What's happening? But we're in, in Palm City and Stewart and Port St. Lucie. Church is still messy. In places where we broadcast to, whether it be Puerto Rico, West Virginia, I'm trying to think of some others, New York, Canada, Chicago, uh, Tennessee, Alabama, let me see, where are we else we've been recently? Uh, New Jersey, mm, Carolina, I think, was on the list. Church is messy. It doesn't matter. We sacrifice for what we love. That's what love does. We sacrifice. If marriage is self-serving, you're going to end up in divorce. If family is self-serving, it's going to end up being an idol. If your life is all self-serving, you're just going to use people as rungs in the ladder to get wherever you want so you can sit there and be by yourself and nobody cares. We make sacrifices for our kids, for our family, for our country. But do we make sacrifices for our faith? Sure, we give, we tithe. I come in, I gave my tithe, Pastor, I did my thing. But what do we do that says that we love one another? Do we spend time, we get in a hope group and listen to people pour their hearts out and be there for them and pray for them and get involved in their lives at a level that brings encouragement to them because they love us and they'll do the same thing for us too. Love is a sacrifice of our pride. Love is a gift from our hearts that doesn't expect anything in return. Love is a hope that we give to others even whenever they reject it. Love is the reason why we get messy with people who are covered in this world's lies, deceit, and and sin. Love is the reason why we don't give up. Love is the reason why we always give our best first, never last. Love is the reason why we stand out from all the rest. But before you can love one another, you have to love Jesus first. John 14, 15, if you love me, obey my commands. Now, some may say, I agree, Pastor, but you nor anybody else is going to tell me how to interpret the Bible. The following is a commercial. It will sound like a rant. I'm just going to tell you right up. It's a commercial. Hang in there. Just saying, hang in there. Because you're saying, oh, he lost it. No, 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 no. Hang in there. There is now on social media more false teachers and more false prophets spewing lies about the Word of God than I have ever seen in my life. And this has happened, it's been happening all along, but in the last 12, 18 months it has exploded all over the place. There was a guy on there and he's teaching stuff and he looks, he looks the part. I mean, he's got the evangelist sweeping haircut. Some of you know what that means. 
He's got a suit and a tie, and he's young, and he's holding a big old thick Bible out there in front of him, in front of him, and he's going on, and he's preaching like, he sounds a lot like Oral Roberts to me, maybe R.W. Schambach, for those of you who know those guys, get on there, and God said, this is what the Word says, and I want you to see in here how God is beginning, he's starting to, and I'm listening to him out in one minute, and I said, you are the biggest liar on the internet that I have seen in a long time, because all of his theology was built off one fact that God and Jesus are having an argument all the time. And so he was there to interpret the Bible for them so that they could understand what God was saying and what Jesus was saying because they're never going to get along. And I wanted, honestly, there was a holy unction that came upon me. I wanted to reach through that phone and find him and love him suddenly in Jesus' name. I tell you what, I was it. Mm. I am not ranting. I am not. Stop. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 says, Now there, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Follow real spiritual leaders. Do not rely upon the internet for your theology. The internet will tell you what, it, what you want to hear. That's what it's there for. You want to believe a lie, it'll tell you it's a truth. You want to believe a truth, it'll tell you it's a lie. I, it's just the most confusing place you can go to try to find. Why don't you just ask Jesus for help? Cut the internet out and go directly to him. It's just a thought. Follow people who are real pastors and real teachers who are called of God. Men and women who will say what the Holy Spirit tells them. And let me tell you, those men and those women of God, they're messy. They got problems. They're dealing with issues. They're trying. Some of them fail. Some of them get through it. Some of them make a comeback. Some don't. But that doesn't mean that God ain't use people to speak into your heart. They will do what God called them to do. And if they do it right, they're going to make a mess out of you. Because some of you leaving here today going and go, yeah, there's one of them right there. Anyhow, here's the second thing. Work to learn the Word of God. Work. It isn't a secret. It isn't a mystery. It just takes work. And learning the Word of God is messy. He said, how, do you, how can you say that? I have a four-year degree in Bible and theology from Central Bible College, Springfield, Missouri. Now they call it Evangel University, CBC College of Bible, whatever. But anyhow, they, they, I, at four years, I got beat up. <laughs> I get more professors come along going, Russ, you can't believe that. The, uh, you got there. I mean to tell you what, I learned. I mean, it was, and it's an art, by the way, in case you're wondering, it isn't a science. You learn how to study the Word of God. You learn how to do it. But because we're lazy, did I use the L word? I'm sorry. That because we're lazy, we just want to go to the Internet and find out what they have to say, and then we're going to believe it. Why don't you open the Bible for yourself? Yeah. I can go off on this. I'm running out of time. If you love His Word, then you will love others. If you love His Word, you will love others. So, if you've got a weak relationship with the Word of God, you're going to have a weak love to extend to others. A strong relationship with the Word, strong love. No relationship, <laughs> no love. Now, hang in there for those of you online. Don't you get off there yet. We know when you get offline. we got computers. We know how to use them, all right? So hang in there. So I want to tell you something for everybody else, too. If you say, I love Jesus, do you know his word? Do you know his word? Now, I've studied the Bible my whole life, and I still ain't got to the bottom of it. And I've got a pretty good feeling I'm not going to until I'm in the presence where I can ask some questions to him face to face. But in the meantime, I have discovered there is enough there for me to work on. I don't need to worry about what I don't know. I need to discover what I can know. 
And what I see there is the fact that as I need to get ready to get messy, if I'm really going to do what he says, then I need to be prepared to be awakened in the middle of the night. So do you. I need to be prepared to go to places that I didn't think I'd ever be invited to, to talk to people that I never thought would want to talk to me, to do things that I thought I would never do. And you say, why is that? Because that's what Jesus did. Whenever we begin to understand this and what the Word says, it will have a profound impact upon our love. Messy church is going to be messy church, but it's messy with a purpose. So that room in your house that you really don't want to mess with, the only purpose is there is just to ignore, procrastinate, put it away, hide it. No, let's get that stuff out. Let's deal with it in Jesus' name. And let's forgive, let forgiveness do its job. Let grace show up and do its job. Let mercy begin to show up and do its job. Amen. Stand with me if you would. Father, I thank you for what you've done for you. Many blessings. Lord, I pray that you pour out your spirit upon your people here for the next few moments. Lord, I thank you for what you're going to do. I praise you for that. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to ask you this simple question. Do you want to get messy? <laughs> do you want to get messy? For those of you online, do you want to get messy? Hang in there with me. I'm, I'm not done with everything yet, but um, do, do you do you ready for it? Pastor, I don't know if, if, I, if I can do this. I don't know if I've got enough energy. I don't know if I have enough time. I don't know if I have the patience for this. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Here's Here's where you're messing up. Let me help you out right here on this one right here. The answer to your question is you're right. You don't. The, the follow-up answer to the statement to that is you don't need to have it all. Jesus does. The whole idea behind le leaning into the Word of God is to lean upon Jesus to give you what you need to be that person that will be a light that shines in that dark place. And that dark place may be next door, it may be across the street, it may be across the world. I don't know what it is for you. But right now, I want you to know, quit looking at yourself as the solution and start putting your eyes upon Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of your faith, and let him work through you in such a way that you've never imagined before. And you say, well, where is that going to lead me? Messy places with messy people. And it's worth it all crucifixion was ugly horrible the whipping, the beating everything that Jesus endured for you and me a, a tomb, it's not a beautiful place, we treat it as such because Jesus rose out of from the get but a grave itself is not beautiful we, we look to the things that are around us and understand it is out of that, that mess that this world that hell tried to do to extinguish the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, came out of it a beautiful thing that changes our hearts and lives, and it was all done in the name of love, to love one another. What is it here today that he wants to be able to do in your heart and life? Are you ready to get messy, Lord, I pray for every person here who says, yes, I want to get messy, Lord, that you will lead us to be more like you. We must go to your word to know what that is. We must read your word. And Lord, I pray that you will begin to put that, that unction in our heart day after day after day. You know, some days, Lord, we're not going to feel like it. Some days, we're going to ignore it. Some days, we're not going to do our devotions every day. Lord, I pray that you will, you, you will do a work in order to put us on the right track. We embrace the messy to your glory and honor. We don't wear it as a badge of honor. We wear our love. Lord, and if, if touching people's lives makes the rest of the world look at us and say, wow, you guys are really dirty, okay. Lord, let the homeless find a place. Let the abuser find a place. Let the divorcee find a place of love. Let those convicted criminals find a place of love. Let them find hope. Let them find life. Because we're not here to judge. We are here to let Jesus do his will. 
that's more important than anything else. And we give you glory and honor and praises for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody give glory to God in this place. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, hang in here with me for a moment before I give you your blessing. One of the things the Lord has really put, pressed upon my heart, and, and he's been doing this for the last few months, but this last week and this message I just, just really lit me up. I, I really just, and I don't know have a complete answer for it, but I'm looking into different methods in order to be able to help you learn the Word of God. There are plenty of resources. We've got more resources than we know what to do with. It's finding the right ones. It's most, most important. And the ones that are Pentecostal. Hallelujah. Amen. Because the ones that reflect our faith would be a great idea in order to be able to do that. But I want to, so that, the, so that and it's going to take weeks in order to get this up and running and everything, but I want to be able to find ways to be able to help you grow in the Word of God every day. And not just, so I don't want you to feel like you're out there on your own, just trying to figure it out and make it up as you go along. That's a mess, that's an idea, and a disaster looking for a place to happen. And I don't think we need to do that. But so that by this fall, and that isn't that far from now, hello, uh, so that by this fall, we will be able to give you the resources you need to grow in the Word of God. Biblical illiteracy needs to come to a stop. And not only that, you need to be equipped to be able to face the biblical illiteracy that will confront you out in the streets. So that you will be able to say, thus saith the Lord, and this is exactly what the Bible says. And this is the truth. Because the church of Jesus Christ is called to defend the gospel. We are called to raise our voice. We are called to bring love, but we're called to stand our ground. Because not today, Satan, you're not going to get away with it. And we're going to see lives changed as a result of it. Somebody give praise to God for what he's going to do. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless.